Um, well, we're, we're very excited to have Nina Aganagic from UC Berkeley uh, telling us about knot categorification and mirror symmetry. Okay, um, thank you very much for, uh, for um, letting me uh, give you a talk. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, so I'll tell you about uh, the work that appeared in two papers and a little bit uh, beyond. Okay, let's see if I can share my... Okay, so in this talk, I'll describe how mirror symmetry uh, solves the problem of categorifying quantum link invariants. The problem was introduced in uh, 98 by Kovanov, who showed how to associate to a link a collection of bi-graded vector spaces that are graded by cohomological grading and an additional equivariant grading, such that their equivariant or the characteristic is the Jones polynomial. The vector spaces themselves are link invariants. The problem Kovanov initiated is to find a physical or at least geometric meaning of Kovanov homology, one that works uniformly for all gauge groups. Edward Witten explained in 88 that Jones polynomial comes from Tersimus theory with gauge group uh, based on um, Lie algebra S2 with uh, effective Tersimus level that's related to the variable Q of the Jones polynomial. This placed the Jones polynomial into a more general framework, uh, which one gets um, by considering Tersimus theory based on different, gate, uh, different Lie algebras and varying their presentations. I'll explain that Kovanov homologies also have origin in physics, which places them into a more general framework, um, similar to um, what Witten did in 88. From string theory, uh, I derived two different solutions to this not categorification problem. The first uh, approach is similar in spirit to that of Kamnitzer and Kautis. It's based on the derived category of coherent sheaves of a certain very special class of polymorphic symplectic manifolds, which uh, play a role in uh, the geometric Langlands correspondence. Recently, Ben Webster proved uh, that this approach is equivalent to his early approach based on um, KRLW algebras, and moreover, that uh, it generalizes them uh, to invariance of knots in R2 times S1. The main subject of this talk is the second approach, which is based in symplectic geometry. It's related to the first by uh, what I call equivariant mirror symmetry. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Equivariant homological mirror symmetry is not an equivalence of category, but um, a correspondence of objects and morphisms between them. The second approach will also turn out to have uh, an algebraic description by a version of KRLW algebras, but um, much simpler. The two approaches I will describe are complementary um, to the approach being developed by Witten in that they describe the same physics just from a different perspective. String theory played a crucial role in discovering the story I'll tell you about. However, the final answer does not depend on understanding it and it will not feature in this talk. So in the same 89 paper, uh, Witten showed that underlying Tresimus theory is a two-dimensional conformal field theory uh, associated to, to uh, G and, and Kappa uh, with affine Lie algebra symmetry. This will be our starting point. To get invariants of knots in R3 or S3, one typically starts with the Riemann surface, which is a complex plane with punctures. It's equivalent, but for our purposes better, uh, to take the Riemann surface to be a punctured infinite cylinder. This way, the theory is able to describe uh, links um, not only in R3, but R2 times S1 as well. To a puncture at a finite point, um, we'll associate a finite dimensional representation of the Lie algebra, which uh, throughout the talk will be uh, minuscule. To punctures at the two ends at infinity. Uh, I don't know what a minuscule representation is. What is it for SU2? Uh, for S, so all representations of SLN are minuscule. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so to punctures that are two as an infinity will associate a pair of infinite dimensional re representations whose highest weight is not integral. To this data, conformal field theory associates a vector space, a space of conformal blocks. This is a space that quantum group will act on. And it's very important for us that it's not just an abstract space, but it actually comes from something. It's a space of conformal blocks. So a conformal block is, um, Per definition, obtained by sewing so chiral vertex operators 
which are associated to punctures and which act as intertwiners of intermediate Vermont modular presentations. Rather than thinking about them this way, uh, we all think about them as solutions of a differential equation. This equation um, uh, is the equation discovered by Knizhnik and Zemologikov in 84. Uh, more precisely, um, it is a trigonometric version because we're taking the Riemann surface to be an infinite cylinder as opposed to a plane. By varying positions of punctures, um, we get a colored braid in the Riemann surface times time and a monodromy problem, which is to transport the space of solutions to the KZ equation from time zero to time one along a path specified by the braid. This monodromy problem was solved by Dreenfeld and Kono in 89. Uh, they show that uh, the monodromy matrices of this KZ equation are given in terms of R matrices of the quantum group corresponding to G. So it's the action of, by monodromies that turns the space of conformal blocks into a module for the quantum group. In the representation associated, the tensor product of um, all the representations of the punctures, more precisely in the subspace of it, a fixed weight on which braiding acts irreducible. Now, you can represent any link as a closure of some braid. The corresponding quantum link invariant is then a matrix element of the braiding matrix between a pair of conformal blocks associated to the top and the bottom. The conformal blocks that serve as caps and the caps are very special solutions of the KZ equation, which diagonalize um, braiding of the matched endpoints. Uh, the KZ equation and solutions, as we'll see, have a geometric interpretation. In fact, they have a pair of them. This serves as a starting point for categorization of link invariants, for the reason I'll explain. So from now on, we'll specialize uh, to um, G being simply laced, so it's of AD type. There is a generalization to non-simply laced Lie algebra, but in, it involves uh, at least one extra step. Um, the, um, Kz equation has a geometric interpretation as uh, what's called the quantum differential equation of a certain holomorphic symplectic manifold. This is a theorem um, of Danielenko, who is a, a postdoc at Berkeley. The quantum differential equation is an equation for flat sections of a connection of a, on a vector bundle with fibers cohomology groups of x over the complexified KLM moduli space. It's, um, the connection is defined using quantum multiplication by divisors, and it was introduced by um, the equation was introduced by uh, Givental. The manifold uh, X we need for the quantum differential equation to coincide with this KZ equation can be described as a moduli space of singular G monopoles with prescribed Dirac singularities on R3. G here is a Lie group of adjoint type uh, with Lie algebra G. If we were to take uh, G to be SO3 uh, the, the, and, or, and little g, SU2, the very same space is the space studied by, um, uh, the, the, that featured in the work of uh, Seidel and Smith. For every vertex operator, we place a singular G monopole of charge equal to the highest weight um, of the representation V um, corresponding to the puncture. At the origin of C, remember our uh, monopoles are in R3, which we break up into C times R. So the, mon the singular monopole is at the origin of C and at the corresponding point in this real line. Um, which, so you obtain um, this just by forgetting this, its position on a, on a circle on the, of the infinite cylinder. The total monopole charge, um, including um, that of of singular monopoles plus the smooth on monopoles is um, a, a fixed weight in the um, G representation, which is the product of all representations associated to the punctures that conformal blocks take values in. The monopole moduli space is parameterized in part by positions of smooth monopoles on R3 the positions of singular monopoles are fixed and they're the module of the metric. This manifold X has several, several other useful descriptions. Uh, per, uh, perhaps the most familiar uh, in the math literature is as a resolution of a transversal slice in the affine Grassmannian of G. 
the labeling here encodes um, the singular monopole charges um, in order in which they appear on the this chosen real line. And uh, nu is the total monopole charge. This description arises by thinking of the singular G monopoles as a sequence of Hecke modifications of polymorphic G bundles on um, C parameterized by R. To physicists, this same X is also a Coulomb branch of a certain three-dimensional gauge theory, <clears throat> whose the theory, the gauge theory is determined by um, uh, uh, the singular and smooth monomorph charges or which conformal blocks we study, which not invariants we want to study. So all the ingredients um, have a, a geometric interpretation in terms of X, starting with the relative positions of punctures on the Riemann surface, which are the complexified Kähler moduli. The complex X is holomorphic symplectic. The complex structure moduli are frozen because all the singular monopoles are the origin of this extra complex plane. Um, so we took the Riemann surface to be a cylinder rather than a plane because the B fields that pair with real Kähler moduli to get the complex ones are periodic. We work, we'll work equivariantly with respect to, uh, uh, because the axis holomorphic symplectic for quantum cohomology to be non-trivial, one has to work equivariantly with respect to a torus action that scales the holomorphic symplectic form. Um, this action acts on this uh, C in R3 R by, uh, by simply scaling it. And it's a symmetry because all the singular monopoles are the, are the origin. We'll work equivariantly with respect to a larger torus of symmetries uh, um, that uh, includes the, um, param whose param the equivariant associated equivariant parameters tell you um, what are the Verman module weights. These extra parameters is what you need, um, what the theory naturally has if you're studying not invariants on R2 times S1. They're associated with holonomies around the S1. <clears throat> the fact that um, um, KZ equation solved by conformal blocks has a geometric interpretation as the quantum differential equation of X implies that conformal blocks themselves have a geometric interpretation. The solutions of the quantum differential equation, as they come out of um, Gram of Witten theory, are given tells J functions. The equivariant counts of holomorphic maps of all degrees from a domain curve, which is best thought as an infinite cigar with a circle boundary at infinity. You can think of it as a P1, but it's better to think of it as an infinite cigar. Um, now, this geometric interpretation has more information than conformal blocks themselves, because underlying Gram of Witten theory is a two dimensional supersymmetric sigma model with X as a target space. Um, to get a J function in the interior of this long cigar, supersymmetry is preserved by an A type twist. And at infinity, one places a B type boundary condition. The infinite length of the cigar makes the A-type supersymmetry preserved in the interior compatible with any supersymmetry on the boundary, including that of B-type. The boundary conditions form a category, and the category of boundary conditions in the sigma model uh, on X preserving B-type supersymmetry and working equivalently with respect to torus T is known as the derived category of T-equivariant coherent sheaves. If you pick a specific beta brain as the boundary condition and infinity, specific object of the category, of the derived category, um, the supersymmetric partition function computes given tall J function and depends on the, on the object of the derived category only through its K-theory class, equivariant K-theory class. So now a braid has a geometric interpretation as the path in complexified Kähler moduli that avoids singularities. Uh, because the complexified Kähler moduli positions of the punctures. The monodromy of the quantum differential equation along the path in Kähler moduli gives a geometric realization of the action of the quantum group on the corresponding space of conformal blocks. You can think of it as an abstract action of quantum group of an, on an abstract space, but we'll think of it as action on the space of conformal blocks. From the sigma model perspective, you have yet more information. 
Uh, this whole story is realized by letting the theory, letting the moduli of the theory, Kalen moduli, vary according to the braid in the neighborhood of the boundary at infinity, where the direction along uh, the cigar coincides with the time along the braid. From that, one can derive that the sigma model on the annulus, where the time runs along the annulus and moduli vary according to the braid, computes the matrix element of the monodromy matrix. So a specific quantum group element that, is, that corresponds to the braid. The sigma model on the very same annulus, but where you, now you let the time run around the circle instead, you think of time running around the circle, computes the index of the supercharge preserved by the two brains. Now, in fact, here we can take all the variation of moduli to happen near one of the two boundaries at the expense of changing the boundary condition. The braid group acts by auto equivalences of the derived category because along a path in Kala moduli, the category of beta brain stays the same. So the Euler characteristic of the homology theory manifestly, which you get by thinking about the computation as the annulus with the time running around it, around the circle, manifestly categorifies, uh, manifestly computes the monogamy matrix since we are think free to think of either direction and time. And if you cut the annulus um, along its length to open it up, the cohomology of the supercharge Q, uh, you, you get to, you discover the cohomology of the supercharge Q, which is computed by the derived category as its most basic ingredient, the space of morphisms between a pair of brains. So it follows um, that the derived equivalency, the derived equivalences manifestly categorify monodromy of the KZ equation. This explains a very difficult, this is a physics explanation of a very difficult theorem of Bezrukovnikov and Okunkov which uses quantization of X in characteristic P. We are using this just as a starting point. Now, uh, quantum link invariants should also be categorized by the derived category of coherent sheaves on RX because they can also be expressed as matrix elements of the Brady matrix between pairs of conformal blocks. But for this, you need to find objects that serve as caps and caps. As a now, as a pair of vertex operators come together, the KZ equation gets a basis of solutions, which are eigenvectors of braiding, labeled by representations that occur in the tensor product of the two punctures that come, of the representations coloring the two punctures that come together. This corresponds to changing how, obtained, how you obtain conformal blocks by, by, by sewing, rather than sewing it sequentially like this, you more, na more naturally saw it like this instead. The, the important thing for us is that the cap is a special case of this, obtained by starting with a pair of conjugate representations and picking a trivial representation in their tensor product. So discovering caps it relies on understanding what geometric meaning of this fusion process, what diagonalizes braiding into the draft category. From perspective of X, bringing, bringing a pair of punctures together uh, corresponds to approaching a wall in KLM moduli, where a pair of singular monopoles come together. Nina? Yes? Uh, could, could I just make a comment? Because I, I, I think uh, when the uh, Muhammad's question about minuscule representation, mm -hmm. I, I just like to clarify that not every representation of SUN is minuscule, right? It's, it's just- uh, sorry, the, all the fundamental representations that yeah, make that's, you, that's what you that's meant right. to say. And that's I, what I, I meant just, to say, yes. I, I, I just mentioned that because it's relevant here because if you took an arbitrary representation here, there wouldn't be a unique trivial representation. Exactly, that's right. Okay. That's correct. That's right. That's why we have no, uh, no multiplicities that enter. That's right. So the singularities in the mod mon monopole moduli space are due to monopole bubbling phenomena. At a wall, a collection of cycles in X collapse. Lab one can show this explicitly, labeled by representations that occur in the tensor product. Um, the what the representations label uh, is the charge of a single singular monopole left behind after a number of smooth monopoles bubble up. So it's a geometric meaning of this picture. Now, conformal blocks that diagonalize braiding don't, in general, come from actual objects of the derived category because 
eigenshaves of braiding, um, objects of the derived category on which the braiding functors act only by degree shifts are extremely rare. What I showed in the first paper is that what one gets instead is a filtration on the derived category by the order of vanishing of pi stability central charge, which is the close cousin of performal blocks. And in fact, follows from just classical geometry of X, um, where the terms in the filtration are labeled by the distinct representations in the tensor product. It should be a sum and not a product. Uh, in fact, one gets a pair of such filtrations, one, one on each side of the wall, and crossing the wall preserves the filtrations because, as is familiar from mirror symmetry uh, type intuition, uh, braiding has an effect of mixing up objects of a given order of vanishing of the central charge with those um, whose central charge vanishes faster and which belong to the lower, lower orders in the filtration. Existence of such a filtration is derived and is, sorry, assumes mirror symmetry that I'll tell you about later. Okay. So I'm telling the story a little bit backwards. Um, on the quotient subcategories, derived equivalences act only by degree shifts, which um, depend only on the order of the filtration and the path around the singularity. These degree shifts you can compute uh, from equivariant central charge, which is also a close cousin of performal blocks and computed by equivariant gram witten theory. <clears throat> Derived equivalences of this type are called perverse equivalences. Um, they're envisioned by Roque and Tuang as ways of um, algebraically ca capturing the variations of bridge length stability conditions. But they had very few examples from geometry. The objects that correspond to cups belong to lowest terms of the filtration. So they are necessarily eigenshifts. Even so, they're very special ones for the same reason that identity representation is a very special representation. So you'll find it only near certain walls and not any walls. <clears throat> These brains that correspond to cups uh, turn out to be uh, structure sheaves of vanishing cycles associated to fusing a pair of minuscule representations to identity, complex conjugate minuscule representations to identity. <clears throat> the cycle is a minuscule Grassmannian, turns out to be a minuscule Grassmannian. Um, so using very special properties of perverse filtrations whose existence assumes mirror symmetry I'm gonna tell you about later. And these vanishing cycle brains I proved with it. So with this assumption, it's a theorem with a star that not only do homology groups manifestly categorify corresponding link invariants, they are themselves link, link invariants. Okay. Now, recently, Ben Webster proved that the link invariants that come in this way that um, are equivalent to the invariants he uh, um, defined in 2013 uh, using KRLW algebra studying, studied by Kovanov, Lauda, Rokhbe, and himself. More precisely, you get just invariants of braids on R3 if braiding does not probe the circle of the annulus. But if it does, then you'll get invariants of braids in R R2 times S1. Now, as stated, neither the approach by coherent sheaves nor KRL double algebra is very computation friendly. Um, in the rest, I'll describe how to reformulate the problem and get a much simpler description. So, Description, the second description is based on the Landa Gisberg model, which is um, the equivariant mirror of X that featured so far. Ordinary non equivariant mirror of X is a hyperkähler manifold, which is to a first approximation given by hyperkähler rotation of X because X is homomorphic symplectic. Oops. Uh, now, we are working equivariantly. Uh, since, but since we're working equivariantly with respect to um, a C star action that scales the holomorphic symplectic form of X, all the relevant information about the geometry of X is contained in a core locus that's uh, locus preserved by this action. This core locus preserved by the C star action that scales the holomorphic symplectic form is a holomorphic Lagrangian. It's a moduli space of monopoles on R3 where now all monopoles, singular or not, add the origin of C and points on R. We'll define the equivariant mirror of X, which we'll call Y, 
to be the ordinary mirror of its core. So now we have uh, we have uh, a pair of x's and a pair of y's. I'll call the x we started with the big x, its core, the small x. I'll call the core mirror, the, uh, I'll call the core's mirror, the small y, and the uh, big x's mirror, the big y. The big and the small, the, the, the small x is half the dimension of the big x, hence the name. Okay, so the equivariant mirror is going to be the relation going diagonally. <clears throat> now, while um, the small x embeds into the big x as a homomorphic Lagrangian, the big y fibers over the small y with ho homomorphic Lagrangian fibers. But the bottom row has as much, has to have as much information about the geometry as the top. <clears throat> now, a model example to keep in mind is the big X, which is a resolution of the A minus one surface singularity, space familiar to all. This big X is the moduli space of a single smooth SO3 monopole in presence of M singular ones. But the big X, uh, chosen to be this resolution of the a minus one surface singularity, its core looks like this. It's a collection of m minus one p1s with a pair of infinite disks attached. The ordinary mirror of the big X is the big Y, which is a complex structure deformation of a multiplicative a minus one singularity with a potential we won't need. This multi the big Y is a C star vibration over the small y, which in this case looks like an infinite cylinder with M mark points in the interior. At these mark points, the C star vibration of the big y over small degenerates. The small y you'll notice is a single copy of the Riemann surface where conformal blocks live. And the positions of punctures um, are, as I said, the, um, um, places where the C star vibration degenerates. There are M minus one Lagrangian spheres in the big Y, which are mirrored to M minus one vanishing P1s in the big X. And they project to Lagrangians on the small Y, which begin and end in the punctures. So the basic structure of the geometry. By SYZ mirror symmetry, uh, the small X and the small Y share a common base, which is just in this case, a real line with um, M mark points. Projecting to the common SYZ base of the small x and the small y is the same as projecting the big X, the moduli space of monopoles on R3, to just um, keeping track of positions of monopoles on R. Conjecturally, the equivariant mirror of the big X and the ordinary mirror of its core is Y, which is, uh, so I'll slowly now explain what, uh, what Y is. So Y is roughly speaking a symmetric product of um, uh, as many uh, copies of the Riemann surface um, with punctures uh, as we have number of smooth monopoles. Okay. Including the T equivariant action on the big X and, the, and on the small corresponds to adding to the Sigma model on the small Y a specific potential which is a multi-valued holomorphic function. Uh, it's a multi-valued um, uh, holomorphic function um, on the symmetric product. The divisor, F0, which we're removing, is the, the divisor of zeros and poles of the holomorphic function, which enters W0. That is um, the, the a piece of the potential that comes that's associated with um, the variable Q of not invariance. Removing this divisor from the, from the symmetric product is what's required for Y uh, to be mirrored to uh, X with the C star equivariant action on it. Okay. So specifically the homomorphic function whose zeros and poles we're taking is this, where all the Y's are coordinates on this infinite cylinder viewed as a punctured plane with zero and infinity deleted. So you start with a symmetric product, you, de you delete the divisor. The symplectic form on the small y is inherited from the symplectic form upstairs by restricting it 
restricting the upstairs symplectic form to the vanishing um, to the vanishing um, um, torus fiber, both small y and big are exact symplectic manifolds. The Kähler form that's inherited from the big Y should provide a sequence of blowups that uh, resolve intersections between irreducible component of this divisor F0, which one can partially verify. You can check this explicitly, near singularities where just a pair of punctures come together, but it should be true even at more general singularities where more punctures, sorry, pair of points come together where more points come together. Finally, um, twice the first churn class of Y vanishes, um, the square of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the canonical bundle has a global holomorphic section where omega uh, is just the natural thing that's pulled back from um, the natural uh, product holomorphic form um, on uh, holomorphic one form on A. Um, all right. Now, from the mirror perspective, conformal block um, is the partition function of a B-twisted theory on a, uh, on a very long cigar with a type boundary condition at infinity. Such amplitudes uh, always uh, have the following form that integrals of the top holomorphic form on Y over a Lagrangian. And uh, you include e to the minus W, the lambda Gisbert potential. And then there, in general, some chiral ring operators inserted which is what you need for the uh, amplitude, which, which come from insertions um, of operators at the origin. Now, what we just discovered, um, it reproduces integral formulation of conformal blocks of the affine Lie algebra, which goes back to works of Fagin and Frankel in, and Schechtman and Vartico in the 80s. There is a reconstruction theory due to given talent Tellman, which says that starting with a solution of quantum differential equation or its mirror, one gets to reconstruct all genus topological string amplitudes of any semi-simple two-dimensional field theory. With all representations being minuscule, the big X is smooth, um, so the, the corresponding theory is semi-simple, and the lambda Gisbert potential has isolated critical points. Okay. So we are in this world. So this, Tellum, this theorem of Tellman and Gimental implies that the B-twisted lambda Gisbert model of Y and the A twisted sigma model on X working equivariantly with respect to T equivalent to all genus, even though the dimensions differ. So equivariant mirror symmetry holds at a level of equivalence of topological string amplitude. Corresponding to a solution of Casey equation is an A brain at the boundary of D at infinity. This brain is an object of the category of A brains which is um, the derived Foucault seidel category of Y with potential W. Uh, this category in our case should be thought of as a category of equivariant A brains due to the fact that W is multivalued. The equivariant gradings um, come from a collection of one forms on Y with integer periods. Uh, they're related to the R potential um, as follows. So uh, W0 again is associated with, um, with the part of the potential that keeps track of Q. <clears throat> uh, the equivariant gradings, um, the equivariant grading, so um, this version of the derived Foucault seidel category, uh, equivariant derived Foucault seidel category should essentially be familiar, but I don't, um, from, I, I'm not sure whether the specific variant of it has been studied. Um, so the equivariant grading of a Lagrangian um, is a choice of a lift of phase of e to the minus w to a real value function on the Lagrangian in a way that's analogous to how one defines Maslow grading by lifting the phase of omega to a real value function on L. This restricts the class of Lagrangians one can admit in your category to those for which such a lift exists. The equivariant degree shift operation corresponds to changing the lift of W on L viewed as a graded Lagrangian. At an intersection point um, at which uh, the lifts of W vary, differ by, uh, by shift, 
uh, that intersection point is defined to be the equivariant degree zero generator of the floral coaching complex, where um, star uh, denotes the mass gradient. The flow differential comes from counting holomorphic maps to y. It necessarily has equivariant degree zero because the periods of the one forms vanish around all the non-contractible curves in y. So, so all contractible curves in y. That's apart from the extra grading, um, the uh, morphisms of uh, this flavor of the derived Fukai-Seidel category are simply floral cohomology groups defined in the usual way. Other than both the Lagrangians and the intersection points have this extra equivariant grading. <clears throat> because uh, the target is pulled back from the uh, symmetric product or the product of symmetric products, our theory is a close cousin, close cousin of Hegart floor theory, whose target is simply a symmetric product of D copies of A of the Riemann surface. As in Hager floor theory, uh, one um, gets to replace, uh, to rephrase the A model in terms of counting of holomorphic curves. Uh, instead of counting of holomorphic maps from, um, from the domain D to Y by counting of holomorphic curves in D times the Riemann surface with a pair of projections, one to D as a default cover and one to A. So uh, D is a vector that has as many components, as many, um, a vector of rank, the rank of the Lie algebra. So for SU2, D is just a number, uh, but in general, it's a vector. Uh, so uh, with a pair, so it has a projection to D as a default cover and to the Riemann surface as a domain with boundaries and one dimensional Lagrangians. So this is um, the cylindrical approach to floor theory. So uh, the Lagrangians in Y um, um, are, well, they're always products of D1 dimensional Lagrangians on the Riemann surface. And then the intersection points of a pair of, of Lagrangians are D tuples of intersections of one dimensional Lagrangians taken after permutation. Uh, a holomorphic map uh, from a disk to Y projects with non-negative multiplicities to domains on the Riemann surface. Uh, with boundaries in one dimensional Lagrangians and vertices at their interse intersection point, at the intersections of one dimensional Lagrangians. As in Hager floor theory, one can read off from the Riemann surface, the Maslow index and the equivariant degree uh, of the map to Y. So for example, the Maslow index of the disk in our theory is, um, is simply given by twice the Euler measure. Uh, which is defined in terms of the Euler character of the domain and counting the number of acute and obtuse angles. So in our theory, the above disk has Maslow index two. And, and the counting differs than in Hager floor theory. Uh, uh, because we're working in a theory where this divisor has been deleted, um, the theory turns out to be solvable explicitly. I'm sorry, Nina, I don't understand how deleting the divisor will change the index of the disk. The curves you count are curves that have to fall into Y, and that's a restriction. Right? Um, you can see this restriction as coming um, as, so, as follows. So, um, uh, this particular disk, for example, not only has um, Maslow index two, it uh, also has, it also would have, uh, if these are Lagrangians of the same type, so they, can, they come from the, well, they do come from the same symmetric product. Uh, it also has equivariant degree one. Uh, so what you need is that the pullback of the potential, of this complicated potential to the holomorphic curve, um, it has to be regular on the domain. So you change the moduli spaces you are allowed to study differ. Uh, this, this would be a perfectly fine disk in the symmetric product, but in our theory, we can't include it because it actually turns out to pass through a set we've deleted, okay? In particular, double is not regular on it. So your, your theory must not touch such disks, okay? 
but I still don't understand. So, so you there's you made two statements. One of them was that the formula is different, and the other one is the disks that you count are are not the same. So I can understand the second one, which says something like, there is a class of disks which is allowed in Hagar Fleur and is not allowed in your theory, and yes. you exclude those. Okay. And the only way that I can make sense of the first statement is that the Hagard fleur formula, when specialized to your case, becomes yes. this. Exactly. The That's the statement. That okay. is the statement. Exactly. Okay. That I understand. Thank you. Actually, in the rest of the talk. Oh, good. Okay. So great. Very good. Now, this theory turns out to be solvable exactly. It's equivalent. It turns out to be equivalent to the derived category of modules of an ordinary associative algebra, which we can compute. The potential W, as I said, has critical points which are isolated and non-degenerate. They are labeled by the weights in the representation of G, which conformal blocks take values in. Okay. This mirrors, or um, this mirrors the fact that um, the torus X and X on the big X with isolated fixed points, which get associated to weights of G via geometric Satake correspondence. The critical point equations are a variant of famous Godin type uh, faith ansatz equations from works of Fagin and Frankel and Rishitita. For every critical point of the potential, we get a pair of left and right symbols, which are respectively the set of all the initial conditions for upward or downward gradient flows of real part of W on which um, imaginary part of W is constant. The set of symbols depends on the chamber in equivariant parameter space. There's a choice of chamber in which all the left symbols are simply products of real line Lagrangians on a Riemann surface or the isotopic to that. By, design, by, by the theorem of Seidel, um, these symbols sh should generate the rap Fukai Seidel category uh, of Y with potential W, where the homes between the brains are defined in the usual way by turning on quadratic Hamiltonian um, near both ends um, on, on the Riemann surface or lifting that to the symmetric product. <clears throat> the symbols generate um, uh, the, the homes between them are not just a vector space, but an algebra because you inherit the product from Floyd theory. This algebra turns out to be ordinary associative algebra graded only by equivariant degrees because all the algebra elements turn out to have cohomological degree zero. In particular, the action of the differential is trivial. You can see this from the fact that essentially the, the holomorphic form is the holomorphic form on the Cartesian product. So this, the theory very much behaves like just a Cartesian product, even though it's not Cartesian product of, of cylinders. Okay. It's not that because of the non-single value, value potential. If you think of Hegard floor theory as a theory of fermions, ours is a theory of anions okay. on the Riemann surface. Uh, so while there aren't many holomorphic discounts that one can evaluate explicitly, all the ones that contribute to the algebra products are computable because they come from products of triangles, which are largely determined by the d equal to one theory. The calculation is entirely analogous to that uh, by a rule in the context of Hegard floor theory. In particular, there are no funny disks passing through punctures that contribute. So the, such an associative algebra A can always be thought of as a path algebra of a quiver whose nodes correspond to critical points of the potential and where paths from one node to another include a homes. For us, these quivers will always have closed loops in contrast to simpler theories coming from sing single value potential. So you'll get a richer representation theory and a richer derived category. In our running example, uh, Y, which is the equivariant mirror of the A minus one surface, the algebra you get is the path algebra of a fine A minus one quiver with uh, the following relations, which capture symbol intersections and uh, relations between them. For more general Y associated with general uh, G, the algebra is best represented graphically. So start with a cylinder. Uh, with M red strands, uh, one for each uh, puncture on the Riemann surface. 
colored by the highest weights of the corresponding representations. The order of the strands is the order of the punctures uh, on the S1 in the Riemann surface. Okay, so we just project to in which order the punctures appear. In fact, this S1 and the S1 in the Riemann surface, which is an infinite cylinder, should be thought of as identified. Okay. Um, while as <laughs> the vertical direction is the direction um, of our two dimensional theory, which we're studying the space direction. So the algebra element. Uh, is a configuration of blue strings, each labeled by positive simple root of G. The configuration at the bottom is determined uh, by the by the symbol you start with, and it, and uh, by the uh, and uh, the configuration at the top by the symbol the home goes to. Uh, this the C zero covariant degrees turn out to have. Uh, um, Turn out to be obtained simply by counting intersections of blue strings with each other. For, for each intersection of blue strings with each other, you get equivalent of the equivariant degree is n, where q to the n is this. And uh, so if the blue strand intersects the, the red like this, you get this and so forth. The other equivariant degrees capture the winding numbers of, str of, uh, of strands around the cylinder. The algebra multiplication is simply stacking cylinders and rescaling. And the relations say that the blue strings need to be taught or the algebra element vanishes. The KRLW algebra, which we'll call script A of Kovanov, Loud, uh, uh, Rokwe, and Webster, or, um, is given in similar terms, but it has more generators and correspondingly different relations. By, uh, um, Resolve the Webster, it should describe uh, the derived category of coherent sheaves on X. So it's on the big X. So it's na naturally more complicated because the space is bigger. Now, all the right symbols. So in a, remember, so, so far we just talked about the, the, uh, the left symbols. We also have the right symbols. The right symbols in the same chamber um, turn out to be compact and they're of course dual to the left. So this implies that every right symbol is a simple module of the algebra A. The one uh, that corresponds to the uh, quiver representation of rank one for one of the nodes, the node corresponding to the symbol and zero for all the others. I'm sorry, Nina, again, I don't understand. What, what is this distinction between left and right symbols and the usual theory of luscious vibrations? Things go to the left, things go, go to the right, both of them are not compact. So what's happening here to make something? So in some sense, here, the, um, they, are, they look compact on the Riemann surface. The, the, the right thimbles look, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit. The right thimbles look compact on the Riemann surface. However, in the symplectic form that's induced from the big Y, the Riemann surface actually develops long tubes where the punctures are. So the punctures are kind of at infinity. Yes. Okay. So if you want, they're not really compact. Okay, I'm still a little bit confused. However, to, de uh, to define their homes, I'm going a little bit fast, but um, to define their homes, you don't need to do anything extra. It turns out already W provides enough wrapping, provides all the wrapping you, you want. So you end up with a wrap for chi, ca for, for chi category after all, right? But here just it's W that, that, that should provide sufficient wrapping. Okay, can I just ask is, I mean, your definition of left and right symbols, th this is really like a definition, right? Like, like if I came in from the right on the red line, you, you, you would get what Mohammed's suggesting, right? The yeah, it's the usual thing you, you, you would have done for that Sadal and you do, except that now the two sets of symbols look very different. But, you're, but it, it, when, when you say right thimble, you, you mean the thimble associated to the blue path or something, right? Yeah, so okay. you, you will, in, in the W plane, right? Some set of symbols go to the you know positive infinity of real W, and the other set of symbols go to negative infinity of real W. That's all. I don't. I guess I don't really understand because, like, like it's all dependent on path. So, it, it, what what we call left and right, yeah, doesn't matter. What does matter is the real part of W uh, diverges to positive infinity on one set of symbols and to negative infinity on the other. But you could come in on the red line from the right. Are you saying that's equivalent to coming in on, on the both? Line? Sorry, here on both red lines at both infinities of the red line. Yeah. Sorry, 
the, the real part of W would go to either plus or minus infinity, or oh, it would do the same oh, thing see. on both. Okay. 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 And near the punctures, mm. uh, for the blue symbols, mm. W real part of W would do the opposite. Okay. Thanks. If on the red on the red ones it goes to positive infinity, on the blue ones it will go to negative infinity. So, I think we should continue and then we can ask questions at the end. Yeah. So, oops. So, uh, once more applying the theorem of Seidel, uh, we get an equivalence of derived category of derived for Seidel category with the derived category um, of uh, modules of HX uh, coming from uh, the other Uneda function, where now I is the sum of all the right symbols. Now, in our running example, um, corresponding to y being the equivariant mirror of the resolution of the a minus one surface singularity, the algebra a check is essentially the algebra studied by Kovanov and Seidel. The only difference is that the quiver is affine and not open as in their story. Um, the algebraic way to understand this pair of derived equivalences of y to uh, of Fukai Seidel category of y to either a or uh, derived category of a modules or a check modules should be causal duality. Uh, because the, the pair of Uneda mappings that pr pr provide these equivalences map uh, the left symbols to projective modules of A and simple modules of HX and the right symbols to simple modules of the algebra A and indecomposable, indecomposable injectives of HX. And of course, with Kozul duality, there are many other consequences for um, like formality. Uh, now, these two algebraic descriptions of the right for chi -sidal category should make mirror symmetry manifest. Now, so let's go back to not invariant. So um, mirror symmetry helps us understand exactly which questions we need to ask to recover homological not invariants from Y. We know what to ask on the big X, but what do we do on the small Y or small X? So. Indeed, uh, because small y is, should be the ordinary mirror of the small x, we should start by understanding how to recover homological not invariance from the small x instead of the big x. So every um, object of the derived category on the big x that's relevant comes from an object on the core um, via a functor that simply interprets a coherent sheaf on the core as a coherent sheaf on uh, on the small x as a coherent sheaf on the big x. And this functor has an adjoint that goes the other way uh, that corresponds to uh, tensoring with the structure sheaf of the core and restricting. Adjointness means the usual thing that uh, for any pair of brains on the big x that come from the small x, the homes between them computed upstairs agree with the homes downstairs, provided you take uh, the f brain replace it by a brain that you get by sending it up and then back down. By mirror symmetry, for every pair of B-type brains upstairs on the big X, there should be a pair of A-type brains on the small Y, which a mirror to the corresponding brain on the small X, such that the homes on Y agree, uh, on the small Y agree with the homes on the big X. Um, now, uh, one can also simply go vertically from the small y to the big y. And um, the functors that enter uh, relate objects on the small y and the big y in a way that mirrors what happens on the v side. Their construction via Lagrangian correspondences is joint work with um, McBreen and Shandon. That's in, been in progress for quite a long. One expects that um, mirror symmetry uh, relating the upstairs series has an algebraic description as well. The algebra script A, uh, or the big A, uh, um, whose derived category of modules is the derived category of coherent sheaves on the big X, is the endomorphism algebra of the tilting vector bundle on the big X, whose construction is given um, in works by Vesdokovnikov and Kaladin using quantization of X in characteristic P. Uh, by work of uh, uh, Webster, the algebra, uh, big A, uh, should be the cylindrical version of the KRLW algebra, um, 
it, in fact, it's his theorem uh, that, that this is true. Uh, it's given, as I said, in similar terms, but it has more generators and more relation, and, uh, and the blue strands are, are allowed to carry dots that are set to zero in small a. Now, in our running example, um, one has the equivalence of the derived category of coherent sheaves on the resolution of the a minus one singularity with an algebra big A, which is a path algebra of the same quiver as for the small a, except with different relations. Uh, imposing the relation that gives us A instead corresponds to restricting the big X to the small X, um, whose category of brains is the category of modules on the small algebra. So in this way, homological mirror symmetry becomes manifest. So this is how um, mirror symmetry should be understood more generally in this theory. Uh, now going back to, from the examples to the more general story, <clears throat> Uh, composing um, this functor that um, sends the brain upstairs, downstairs uh, with mirror symmetry, we get an exact functor going diagonally down that sends components of the tilting vector bundles to left symbols. <clears throat> this functor per exactness takes the complex giving a projective resolution of an object upstairs in terms of tilting generators. Um, to the complex of left symbols um, that resolve its image. Similarly, composing the functor going up with mirror symmetry, you get a functor going up diagonally, which is also an exact functor that sends the right symbols to simple, which are simple modules of the algebra A, to uh, simple modules of the algebra um, script A upstairs. Um, these brains are uh, dual to components of the tilting generator in the usual way. The fact that you can compute the homes follows from equivariant mirror symmetry because it exactly re relates them. Anyway, the key to applying this to link invariance is that the brains that serve as caps and cups in the construction uh, using coherent sheaves on the big X are brains uh, which are symbols of the algebra script A and which come from the right symbols in the small y and symbols of, this, of the downstairs algebra of the small a. So this has a simple but striking consequence that gives us a new perspective, I think, on Lincoln homologies. <clears throat> so equivariant mirror symmetry relates the computation of homes upstairs to the following computation downstairs, where uh, the brain E that serves, serves as a downstairs cap and is obtained by starting with the upstairs cap and sending it down, and uh, uh, where uh, B is its image under the braiding functor. And braiding commutes uh, with everything as, uh, as manifest in the, uh, on the A side. So we are supposed to compute the homes with the uh, simples downstairs with, uh, with the brains obtained by starting with the simple downstairs, braiding it, sending it up, and pushing it back down. That's the B brain. Now, by virtue of, um, uh, of this derived equivalence, as any other brain in the Foucault saddle category, the braided uh, cap brains have a projective resolution as a complex, every term of which is a sum of thimble brains of, the, of these left thimbles that generate uh, whose homes, whose anamorphisms is algebraic. This complex describes how you get the brain starting with the direct sum of symbols and taking connected sums, which deforms the differential from trivial, which it is on the, on the symbols, to, uh, to a non-trivial differential describing the brain. And from this complex that describes the brain, you get for free a complex of, of vector spaces with an action of differential on them that squares to zero. The link homology is the homology of this complex. So all we need to do is we need, we need uh, and every home here is simple because every term is just a direct sum of the left symbols, which are dual to the right. So all of these are directly, so all the terms are direct sums of vector spaces, which you know immediately as soon as you know the resolution. So it means that we get a second purely classical description of not homology groups, which we can read off from the description of the braided um, cap brain 
as a bound set of symbols without any further work. Correspondingly, the meaning of link homology is a small part of the cohomology of the complex that describes the brain. In fact, per construction, the vector spaces that you get as at the k term in the complex is simply spanned by intersection points of the of, of, of the two brains of uh, equivariant degree j and mass level index k. So the complex is isomorphic to the floor complex. The differential constructed classically from the geometry of the brain simply sums up the action of instantons. So this is how the algebraic description, that this is how algebraic description in a sense mirror symmetry solves the not categorification problem. So let me just give one example. So recall our example of Y, which is the equivariant mirror of X, which is the resolution of the A minus one surface singularity. So mirror to the i vanishing P1 in X is a Lagrangian, which is just a straight line between a neighboring pair of functors. The functor that goes up amounts to pairing a brain downstairs with a fiber over it, okay? The functor that goes the other way doesn't send the vanishing sphere upstairs back to the interval. Instead, computing it either from mirror symmetry or by its definition by Lagrangian correspondences, you find a figure eight Lagrangian. Now, the basic feature of these adjoint homes that you preserve the, the uh, uh, of the adjoint functors that they preserve the homes is, is manifest in this example. Okay. Now, this example, the ironic example, um, corresponds to uh, small g being SU2 and big X being the modular space of one smooth SO3 monopole in presence of M singular ones. If you take the big X instead to be a modular space of D smooth SU2 monopoles in presence of M singular ones and take M to be 2D, you're in a setting relevant for carbon homology. Okay, um, you, you should be able to get from this X or in the corresponding to variant mirror, carbon homology of any link obtained by closing the braid with two D strands. <clears throat> so it's equivariant mirror is obtained uh, by starting with the configuration space of D unordered points on the Riemann surface and deleting the locus where any pair of points collide either with each other or with one of the punctures um, with the potential that uh, one can deduce from what I had wrote down before. So in the big X, the cap and the cap brains are all structure shapes of a vanishing cycle, which is simply a product of D non-intersecting P1s. Um, the cup brain, both the caps and the cup brain upstairs come by this functor that goes up from a cup brain on the small y, which is simply a product of D non-intersecting intervals. The cup brain, the other one on, on the small y, is the image of the uh, of the of the uh, of the brain we get upstairs under this functor. So the result is a product of D non-intersecting figure eights. <clears throat> the homological link invariant is the space of morphisms between uh, uh, the pair of brains, the, the one that looks like a product of intervals, and the other one that looks like this, more complicated. Um, so in fact, in this lando gisberg description, both the Lagrangians and the action of braiding on the geometric, so you can simply start with a projection of the link on the surface and then translate it to a pair of Lagrangians. Um, so the mirror Lagrangians, you get by replacing all the red segments by simple intervals and all the blue segments by figure eights. Okay, so, and so this is essentially what I already said that um, the spaces of morphisms, which are uh, a priori defined as the cohomology of the floor complex, um, uh, can be computed algebraic. Now, to evaluate the oil uh, can be computed algebraic, but a priori define, it's defined that it's coming from the floor complex. To evaluate the oil characteristic, all you need is to simply count intersections of Lagrangians, keeping track of grading. And the fact that the Euler characteristic of our theory Compute the Jones polynomial, which is a, an elementary prediction, is a theorem of Bigelow from the 90s. So again, this complex describes how to get the brain coming from symbols. Okay, so let me just give an example. So for a trefoil, 
we would have got we would have gotten the following brain configuration. To for for simplicity to keep it manageable, uh, let's ask about reduced covenant homology, where um, the uh, the homology the I not is said to be trivial. So this lets you re 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 erase the pair of Lagrangians. So we simplify the problem actually to just d is equal to one, which puts us in the setting of our running example. Okay. So uh, to compute reduced covenant homology of, of the of the trifold, you just need to compute homes between um, between these brains. That's of course simple. But um, the B brain has the following explicit resolution, which you can see by breaking it up into thimbles. So instead of writing them horizontally, I'm now writing them vertically with um, uh, explicit maps that come from paths on the D is equal to one quiver, which is just an F I N quiver with the relations that I wrote before. So you get an explicit complex of brains, uh, complex of thimbles. Uh, out of that complex, only a very small part contributes to the, homo to, the, to the homology, which reproduces the reduced covenant homology of the trifoil. So I think this is how one should think about uh, not homology generally. All right, so this is all I wanted to tell you. Sorry, I ran over time. Great, let's thank the speaker so much. Are there any questions for Mina. Um, I have a question. Um, Mina, can you clarify? At some point you talked about this, um, this, can you go back to this divisor in the symmetric product? Yes. Um, Let me see how to do that just a second. And, and I, I think you said that, you know, it's clear how to resolve the singularities when two of the points come together. Now, it didn't look like you had a slide about it. Uh, so, so what should be true is that um, the symplectic form construction of the, uh, let's see, where, where are we? Uh, I'm not sure the slide, like bringing up a slide is, is relevant. <laughs> there are too many of them to find besides, so, okay. Anyhow, let's, let's, let's maybe not try to do that. Um, it would be helpful for me to just see again. So I mean, okay, take, good. take a minute if that's okay. So let's, yeah, yeah, we're fine. Around here, we're close. Yeah, so uh, let's see here. There's our F. A little bit okay. yeah. Yes, there yeah. is this, this, this Y. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so. So there is a, like an F zero, which you've have you did you define F zero in the previous one? Uh, so this is F zero. So what you need to do is pull it back to uh, to what from uh, just a symmetric product to Y uh, by this resolution. So in construction, so um, um, well in, in construction the, of the of the of the adjoint functors with um, with um, with Shen, with Shen and McGreen, it's clear that to construct that adjunct function uh, from a Lagrangian correspondence, uh, you want this very special symplectic form on uh, the small y, the symplectic form that comes from the big y by simply uh, restricting to, uh, to vanishing uh, torus fibers. Okay. And that, that symplectic form should pr pr provide a resolution of singularities, which means that, which, which should make, any intersecting component of this divisor that you're removing uh, break up, okay? In other words, non-intersect. Okay, let me again try to understand what's happening. F zero is, are you saying F zero is like singular and you need to smooth this divisor and then remove it? No, so uh, the divisor F zero is a union of uh, the divisors of zeros and poles of this function. Yes. Okay, so it has a zero anytime any time any uh, point on the cement on the on the Riemer surface hits one of the punctures, or any pair of points um, coincide. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, the resolution of uh, of uh, singularities that's 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 really important to get the correct discounts is the one that uh, that uh, separates that makes the divisors of zeros not intersect the divisors of poles. You need to show the divisors of zeros and the divisors of poles uh, 
uh, in Y do not intersect. They certainly intersect in Y not, because nothing prevents two points on the Riemann surface to come together at the puncture, right? Um, and so what you can, what, um, what, so in case, so if, if, um, if we are just in rank one, so we're studying SU2, uh, then uh, the big Y is um, essentially just the seidel Smith space. Okay. Now in the um, with the correct moduli, uh, with complex structure deformation turned on, and uh, the fact that um, uh, so uh, Manolescu proved that that seidel Smith space is has an implicit in it. Well, it's smooth, firstly. But uh, you can think of it as not just a symmetric product of uh, d copies of a Riemann of, of uh, a m minus one singularity, but actually a Hilbert scheme of d points. And from that Hilbert Hilbert scheme of d points, uh, you also get an implicit Hilbert scheme restricting its corresponding symplectic form. You should get a Hilbert scheme type resolution of y. Okay. So okay. Um, so okay. So you something like there is the Hilbert charmorphism, which goes from the Hilbert scheme to the symmetric product of the, of the complex surface. And you take inside of that, the symmetric product of the Riemann surface. And then you take the sum. I just kind of don't see how that would be smooth, but okay, I can try to think about it. I mean, you can, I worked it out for a pair of points. I think one can do it fairly explicitly. Uh, you know, the explicit, the, 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 the description of the, of the, of the Hilbert scheme uh, already in um, Manolesco's paper is very explicit. I think a paper by um, um, Richard Thomas made it even more explicit. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, you can see that uh, that as a pair of points come together near the puncture, that, that locus actually gets resolved. Okay, thank you. It should be true anyhow by mirror symmetry. But of course, th things that should be true, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's really important for you, this mix. Uh, that, that, yeah, I know. That's it's important for me to. Yeah, yeah, I know. I understand. No, I completely understand. <laughs> okay, I don't know if somebody else has a question, but I have another question. So in the B side, you had all these, um, you, you said that there was this big torus acting and then you restrict it to some C star. Um, and then when you move from A to B, from B to A, you again, focused only on the C star. So That's right. is, is, there, is there some expectation that there's a larger? No, you don't, wanna do, you don't wanna do more than that because if you did more than that, you start, for example, restricting to just fixed points. Uh, that's too little. That doesn't remember anything about the global geometry, right? But uh, what's true, so for example, uh, uh, in, in many of studies of derived categories of coherent sheaves on the big X, these uh, stable envelopes play a role, right? The small X is essentially a union of support of all stable envelopes, right? So it knows, it knows all, it has all the information about the derived category of coherent sheaves and you lose nothing at all, okay? And all the information to describe rating. And more than that, you don't wanna do because you'll start yeah, you. Um, it's not going to be useful, but I think this is just. Uh, I mean, and I think that the smaller theory downstairs is actually a good thing to study because if you were to solve the A model upstairs fully non fully fully, uh, uh, you know, with equivariant gradings and so forth, uh, well, um, you'll get this fairly non-manageable algebra. Well, okay, one of the descriptions is a fairly non-manageable algebra. The others, I guess, algebras that you've studied. <laughs> Mm. Okay. Thanks. But uh, I think there are many things to do here, just purely on mirror symmetry grounds. So, for example, I think this equivariant mirror symmetry should provide uh, a way of const of constructing the, the tilting vector bundle upstairs in the big X, uh, because, for example, you can compute on 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 the on the small y. There's, they are just these simple, um, you know symbols, you can compute the algebra explicitly, and you just have to read off through mirror symmetry. What's the corresponding vector bundle on the small x 
and that that those objects projected downstairs come from projected objects upstairs. So you, you can deduce it, and it knows the core knows all about the churn numbers and so forth. So you can avoid working in characteristic P and get a construction of vector bundles on huge plus space of, of tilting objects mm -hmm. and so forth. And I think the fact that now you're putting the whole story of you know Hager, the, the, theory, the Hager floor theory, which corresponds to taking G to be GL1 slash one, now lives in a, entirely in the same world as Kavanaugh homologies and all the other not homologies, which is very useful as well. Uh, so for example, uh, yeah, so the algebra A that you get for Kavanaugh uh, is related to the corresponding algebra that uh, um, you get for for Hager floor theory, the one that um, um, uh, a rule uh, connected to symplectic where where rules work took place um, is related to, to this algebra just by adding a differential and regrading. So various proofs that of relations of Kavanaugh homology to Hager floor theory should be simpler. I think we'll learn a lot. Are there any more questions for the speaker? Well, if not, let's thank her again for a great talk.